It's a pleasure for me to be in Mumbai. Uh, it's a greater pleasure to be among people who are interested in a new vision for our region and for our countries. Mr. Kulkarni was very passionate in describing the situation that we face, a region that is bound by much more commonality uh, than the economic and travel realities of today uh, manifest. Uh, it reminds me of a couplet by our famous poet Fez Ahmad Fez. And if you find it uh, too Persian eyes, please raise your hand. I'll try and translate it into more Shudh Hindi for you. Uh, but I think uh, you will understand it because it comes from the heart. And he says, Hum ke thehre ajnabi itni mulaqaton ke baad phir banenge aashna kitni madaraton ke baad. The fact is that what is today the subcontinent divided into several countries has several centuries of shared history. Pakistan, the country where I was born, where I was raised, where I uh, am a citizen of and uh, which honored me with several senior positions in Pakistan in, in, in my government, including serving as ambassador, which is a very high honor uh, for, for, for anyone to serve their country and represent it. Uh, but, this, but my country, until 1947, was part of India. And so for me or anybody in my country to deny that historic reality would be a denial of fact. Similarly, it is a fact that today there is a Pakistan. It is armed with nuclear weapons. It has one of the world's uh, uh, six largest militaries. It is a country where most people, including myself, feel that we were born with that name, with that country, with that identity, so therefore we would like to retain it. And that is also a reality. It is also a reality that what was born in 1947 as Pakistan again got divided in 1971 into Pakistan and Bangladesh. So two new countries were born after 1971, or one <coughs> stayed a little sort of from 1947. It's, it traces its identity, the other traces its identity from 71. Before 71, there was no Bangladesh. There were Bengalis. There were Muslim Bengalis. There were Bengalis from East Bengal. But there was no Bangladesh. So this process of new states being created is actually a function of identity politics of the subcontinent. Let us be very realistic about it. It is very interesting that every time I come to Mumbai, I always feel that I need to be in this city for at least two, three years if the Indian government will ever allow me, to conduct a research project on the life of the founder of my country, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who spent most of the years of his life in this city. And if you read my book, uh, uh, Mr. Kulkarni, you will remember that there is a reference in it of Mr. Jinnah's stated desire soon after independence to the Indian ambassador and through the Indian ambassador to Prime Minister Nehru that he wanted his house in Malabar Hills to be maintained as it, ha it was when he left it. Because he wanted to come back to it and live there until his death, after his retirement. This is a fact very few people know. So the, while it was Two political parties, the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League, not being able to find common ground, and you have alluded to it, the Gandhi Nehru correspondence, their discussions. A political, a political argument ended up becoming a division of a subcontinent. By the way, there is a lesson there for those who carry identity politics too far, that sometimes you don't realize the consequences it might have. You unleash identities, you unleash conflict, and you say, you know, we are not. The truth today is that if what happened in 1947, the birth of my country, was actually the consequence of a permanent or perennial conflict between Hindus and Muslims, then uh, Muslims of the subcontinent wouldn't be living in three countries. They would all somehow move into one.
doesn't happen that way. People live where they are, people continue to live where they are, some move, some are gypsies, some are forced under circumstances, some people move from villages to cities, from one city to another, but a lot of people like to remain where they are. And that is why today the Muslims of the subcontinent live in India, they live in Bangladesh, they live in Pakistan, actually they also live in Nepal, they live in Sri Lanka, they live in the Maldives and our Afghan brethren also want to be considered part of our region because of their long historic association with our region as well. After all, we forget that the founder of the Mughal dynasty, uh, Zahiruddin Muhammad Babur, came from Fargana in what is today actually not even Afghanistan. It is today, uh, I think it's today, uh, Tajikistan. And, 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 uh, and so history and the march of history should not make us into permanent enemies. So every time I speak, whether it's to an Indian audience or to a Pakistani audience, I only say one thing. Get over identity politics. Politics will always be like that. Politicians will call each other names. Parties will conflict. Sometimes people will vote one way. Sometimes, sometimes the voting can have longer term consequences as we saw the voting of 1946. The 1946 election which resulted in a bigger, longer term uh, impact on our region. Second, we need to stop being prisoners of narratives. There are two totally different narratives. I mean, it is amazing how little people in India know about Muhammad Ali Jinnah's contribution uh, to, uh, uh, the, uh, to the demand for home rule, to the demand for uh, uh, Indian uh, independence. All he's remembered for is Pakistan. And in Pakistan, unfortunately, there are people who are not remembered and recalled either. Very few Pakistanis know about the contribution of Abul Kamal, Kalam Azad to the independence of the subcontinent. He spoke for all Indians, for all Indians, especially Muslims, but all Indians. Very few Indians know the contribution of Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Very few Pakistanis know, even fewer Pakistanis know the contribution of Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan who on his death chose to be buried in Afghanistan rather than be buried in Pakistan because the state of Pakistan oppressed him. He spent more years in jail after independence than he did as a freedom fighter under British rule and colonial rule. More years than even Mandela. Yes, more years than Mandela. He spent 30 years in prison and most of them after independence. He spent a lot of years uh, in prison uh, before independence under British rule and after independence also. I am, by the way, giving the Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan Memorial Lecture in Delhi in three, four days, uh, and I intend to bring all of this uh, to light. It's important to overcome these narratives, these very young faces I see, especially at the back of the room, some of them straining to kind of uh, look across all the seats to be able to see up here. Um, you have to overcome this baggage of history that the generation, even before mine, created because they were the ones who were involved in the political argument. It's like mummy and daddy who had a big argument and, you know, uh, got divorced and yet, and, and, and then totally abandoned the children. And that's not, that's not the way for the future for us as, as peoples. I won't repeat the numbers, they've already been stated. The rest of the world is moving towards integration and working together, overcoming burdens of history, overcoming ba uh, the baggage of uh, borders. Uh, many of you who travel uh, internationally know that you get one visa now to go to all the European countries. I'm sh I can see some people in this audience who are old enough to remember the time when you, whenever you went on a European trip, you had to get a separate visa for Belgium, a separate visa for France, a separate visa for Germany, a separate visa for Switzerland. You couldn't do. Now you just land in one, take a train, go everywhere one Schengen visa. Europe is becoming more and more integrated. The British, being the British, are now thinking about, you know, this is too much integration because they find that it's, it's excessive from their point of view. But the fact of the matter is that Ireland, which fought the British for so many years, and a much more violent conflict than any conflict that we have known, at least in the subcontinent, the Irish are happy to share membership of the European Union with the British. 
the Germans and the French who fought two world wars and many other wars before that, they are happy to be part of the European Union together. Indonesia, which did not, which protested against the creation of Malaysia, is now part of ASEAN along with Malaysia. And this was much later than our independence. Malaysia became independent in 1967, 20 years after independence of India and Pakistan in 1947. And yet, so the, if, 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 if somebody says these are wounds of history, they have healed the wounds faster. So if they are doing something and they are able to heal their wounds faster, we need to learn from them. ASEAN is something that is working. Philippines had a conflict over, uh, uh, over territory and it still does, by the way. I don't know how many people here are aware of the, I don't want to become a professor in the classroom right now, but you know, if you look at that, that region, they all have disagreements over maritime borders, which island belongs to whom, etc. And yet, somebody among their leaders had the vision, vision to say, all of this will be less relevant if we have shared trade, open travel, <laughs> educational exchanges, some kind of uh, facility for people of one to be able to work in the other, for people from one to the, be able to travel to the other. And the economic benefits have been enormous. Enormous. Economic benefit. Now, in the subcontinent, what have we ended up doing? We have ended up keeping our anger alive. We have kept our wounds open. We have built narratives of history in which children in Pakistani schools are taught that India is a permanent enemy. People in India are always reminded that Pakistan has not behaved, quote unquote, well since independence and has, a, has, has waged war against India. And this permanent state of animosity has resulted in a situation in which countries that have more in common than they have with others have less trade, less travel, less educational exchange. There are more students from India studying in the United States than there are from Pakistan or, Afghan or from Pakistan studying in India, which is an irrational situation. Most prosperous countries in the world do more trade with their neighbors. Why? It's the cheapest thing. You produce something, you sell it next door. Trains can move across uh, land borders like ours. People can go much faster. Things can go. Services can go. Big highways, you know. And then, from the point of view of Pakistan, it will be tremendously advantaged because Pakistan sits at the crossroads of the Middle East, Central Asia, and South Asia. So if oil pipelines have to come from Central Asia, they will come through Afghanistan and Pakistan into India. India is an energy deficit country that needs more energy. From Iran, gas pipelines could come. From Qatar, gas pipelines could come across. Our, and Pakistan would economically benefit from that, and so would India. And then, moreover, we can all, you know, the reason why we probably have these problems is because we have so much in common. We can speak similar and languages. We have an appreciation of similar food. Um, we have uh, 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 our musics are similar, our uh, appreciation of art is similar, our notion of aesthetics is similar. I mean, I'm not endorsing anything here, but you know, fair and lovely sells in Pakistan as much as it does here, unfortunately, in my opinion, unfortunately, because the, mo the notions of, of, of what is fair and what is lovely are similar uh, 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 in both countries. Now there is, of course, the question of why are we not arriving there? And I will tell you why we are not arriving there. We are not arriving there because so far we have always taken the road that we first need to solve the disputes between and among the nations. I see a quote from the Prime Minister of my country right there that, you know, SARC should not be indifferent or oblivious to the differences and tensions between its nations. Yes, but here's the problem. There are two ways two approaches to when you have a disagreement. One is that you solve the disputes first and then you become friends. How many of you have ever succeeded in doing that in your life ever? If you are going to try and solve the dispute first, the dispute will consume you and the friendship will elude you. If on the other hand you say, okay, let's try and work things out together, you know, let's not discuss the, what we, we, we have the argument or dispute over. 
we'll solve that later. First, let us build the friendship. Then what happens? Very often, you end up actually recalling someday, 15 years into the friendship, one of you says, oh, by the way, what was that dispute we used to have and you both giggle over it or laugh over it. Isn't that how it happens in human relations? What are relations between nations except a macrocosm of human relations? It's a bigger level of human relations. I teach international relations in the U.S. and I always tell my students, international relations are nothing but a bigger level of interhuman relations. The same phenomena can be found there. Jealousies, anger, uh, suspicion, fear, all those things that are in interhuman relationships are also between international relations because nations are actually nothing but agglomerations of human beings. And so, what is the future for SARC? I personally feel that the dispute resolution first, friendship later approach needs to be abandoned in favor of become friends and solve the disputes later approach. Second, I think we need to overcome the suspicions that everyone has. India is very large. India is the largest member of SARC. Indonesia is the largest member of ASEAN. Germany is the strongest and most powerful member of of, of, of the European Union. United States is the biggest and the most powerful member of NAFTA. The biggest one, it's always good. When, you, when, when you're very tall, it's always good not to wear high heels, you know, so that others don't feel even more that you're even smaller, you know. If, 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 if a young lady is six feet tall, I would advise her the first step to be able to find an appropriate match is to stop wearing high heels. You know, if you add three more inches, chances fall. So the larger one has to be able to project that. And I am quite um, sanguine that India is able to do that. Prime Minister Modi has taken the first steps towards Bhutan, which is the smallest member of, of SAR. He's gone to Nepal. Hopefully he will have a similar outlook towards Bangladesh. Uh, and then eventually, the harder nut to crack, which is Pakistan. But, but, but that's the, for the bigger one. But there is something that the smaller ones also have to acknowledge. And that is that you can't cut somebody else to size. To think that terrorism and violence is the way to try and uh, take away the advantage of a bigger neighbor and to make that bigger neighbor uh, your equal by un trying to undermine it will only backfire. And that is already happening, unfortunately. So those who have supported terrorism out of Pakistan are now becoming consumed by and are becoming victims of terrorism themselves. I personally feel that the cultural and economic and uh, overcoming of historic narratives approach will bring SARC much more closer, much faster than the previous bureaucratic approach of solving things first and moving forward. I'm going to stop here because I'm sure there's going to be plenty of discussion. It's been a pleasure talking to you all and seeing all of you in this room. Thank you very much.